Welcome to this webinar where we will learn more about the ontology lookup service Zuma and OXO, three ontologies tool provided by the European Bioinformatics Institute. This webinar is organized by the Ontology Committee of Practice of the CGAR platform for big data and agriculture. And I'm Celine Aubert, the communication coordinator of the Ontology COP, and I will facilitate the webinar. And so now let me introduce you to Henriette Armstead. She is the Ontology Tools Technical Lead at the European Bioinformatic Institute, or EBI. Henriette is a software engineer with more than 20 years of experience as a software developer, architect, and consultant in a variety of industries. She has a PhD in artificial intelligence with a specific focus on semantic web technologies. She will now present three great tools to facilitate the use of ontologies. I'm really excited to hear more about them. Over to you, Ariad. Good afternoon, everyone. So for those of you who don't know who EBI is, um, let me tell you quickly. So um, it stands for the Euro European Bioinformatics Institute. We located in the UK, about 10 miles south of Cambridge. Um, we are on the Welcome Genome campus. Um, we are a trusted source of biological and biomolecular um, data. Our core mission is to enable life science research and its translation to medicine, um, agriculture, industry, and society. We have about 800 uh, members of staff coming from over 60 nations, and we are part of the European Molecular Biology Laboratory. Uh, EMBL is an international um, organization that's funded by over 20 members. Uh, member states. Okay, so the data that we have at EBI is quite large um, and quite varied and vast. So we have 270 petabytes of data, at, um, raw data at our last check. Um, and uh, a petabyte is one uh, 1,024 terabytes. So um, that means that a petabyte is over 1 million gigabytes. So that's quite a bit of data. And what we also find is that this data is growing quite substantially. But over and above that is that the rate at which the data is growing is also increasing. So there's a paper that I've got linked at the bottom of this slide that has been written by EBI last year um, that explains this um, increase in the growth of our data as well, if you want to go and look at that. Um, and what we um, aim to do in our ontology tools team is to try and help um, this journey from moving from data to information, to knowledge, to applications. And the way we do that is by adding um, or by using ontologies and adding semantics to the data that makes your data more interoperable and thereby um, uh, we are able to enrich the data. And um, this enriched data is then served, served back to the community. So at the, in the diagram at the bottom, um, I've got the different layers of data that you find in EBI. So typically it comes from the literature right through to um, the various archives to the point where we have the application on terms of let's say drug discovery. Um, and at each point we have, um, uh, biological curators that will annotate the data um, using ontologies, thereby enriching the, this data. And this is then what is served back to our community. And what you um, we find is that we have um, about 60 million requests on a daily basis for our against our services. So the problems that you find in this data, there's two key problems that we encounter constantly. And the one is that you have a concept and that single concept is referred to in various ways. So on the left-hand side, you see that this is the different ways in which um, uh, reference is made to female. Um, on the right-hand side, what you find is that sometimes people are using the same term, but they actually refer to different concepts. So for instance, if you look at um, tibia, then um, a tibia in a human is different than what a tibia is in a fly. But then also you get this genus of um, sea snails that's also referred to as tibia. So um, that's where ontologies comes in, where you, um, to help uh, address some of these issues. 
So, and their core technology underlying um, ontologies, the semantic web technologies, and that's the thing that really enables this interoperability um, of our data. So um, the key facility that uh, on, um, the semantic web uh, defines and um, that's used in ontologies is that for every uh, concept and every term, uh, every relation, you have a unique identifier. That means that when you refer to that unique identifier, you can unambiguously identify what um, concept is referred to and what relationship is referred to. This, these ontologies are also expressed in machine readable format. So typically XML or JSON-LD. Then the data model that's used in semantic web technologies is RDF. Um, and uh, RDF triple consists of a subject, a predicate, and an object. So that is something like Henry owns a pet, where subject would be in red, um, owns will be the predicate, and object will be pet. And you can have numerous facts like this, or triples like this, um, capturing various facts. And the query language that can be used to query this triples are Sparkle. And you um, can find that uh, if you used to relational databases, you can think of RDF triples is uh, basically the data store for semantic web that relational databases is in typically in a transactional scenarios. And um, the query language Sparkle is similar to SQL for relational databases. So underlying in um, ontology is that uh, it has a mathematical basis. Um, that is when you express your ontology in L and RDF is, um, it has a mathematical basis in um, uh, first order logic. That means that um, because it has this uh, mathematical basis that based on the facts that you have um, or the explicitly stated information in your ontology, you can run a artificial intelligence reasoning procedure that then from this explicitly stated information can go and infer implicit information contained in your ontology. Um, it's also important to note that things like JSON-LD, RDF, um, Sparkle, RDF-SL are all W3C standards, which means that in the community, there's at least some level of consensus in how these um, uh, tools should be used. So um, I think one of the key benefits, or um, I, I see that um, ontologies has been very successful in the um, life sciences community. And I think a part of uh, success of this is contributed to the Oboe Foundry. And the role of the Oboe Foundry is that they actually stated um, a number of guidelines to say how you should um, develop ontologies. Um, so they've got um, just over 100 ontologies that are adhering to the principle of open use, collaborative development, non-overlapping, st strictly co um, scoped content. Um, that means that typically um, one ontology in the Oboe Foundry will not overlap significantly with any other ontology if it uh, even overlaps. So, um, and they have common syntax, common relations. Um, so if we look at something like the ontology lookup service, which I will um, look at a bit later in this presentation, um, we have 260 ontologies um, uh, listed in OLS, and about 100 of these ontologies come from the Oboe Foundry, and the rest are coming from other sources. But the value of the Oboe Foundry in giving that guidance um, is definitely not something that should be underestimated or undervalued. And then what we do in our um, ontology um, uh, tools team is that we aim to make um, built services that make these ontologies accessible by humans and by machines. So we provide front ends, um, web front ends to all our tools that makes it easy for users to go and use our tools irrespective of um, the um, potential lack of knowledge of the semantic web. They can go and use these tools without having any deep understanding of the um, semantic web. And then we also provide um, uh, APIs 
that allow you to build uh, pipelines that can um, make use of ontologies. Uh, because of, we provide this um, ontology lookup service um, with a set of ontologies that are all related to um, biological related um, ontologies, we make sure that um, these are ontologies that are uh, relevant to the biological community. Um, we are trying to provide ways to make it easier to scale up the linking of terms to ontology um, uh, terms um, through some of our tools. And that is successful to some extent, at least. Um, and then we also um, work with software developers. Once we've made the um, uh, align their data with ontologies. We help them to make use of our APIs so that they can build their application as, as well um, to access these ontologies. Um, so the tools that we have is OL, is Zuma and OXO. Um, OL is an ontology lookup service. Uh, that's where you can go when you want to have, find more information about a specific ontology and a specific term. Zuma is the service that you will use if you're interested in, um, you have some bit of text that you would very much like to map to an uh, um, ontology term. Um, uh, Zuma will help you in that regard. And then in the case where you um, find a term in an ontology, but the ontology is not the ontology that you um, want to use in your um, environment. So you would prefer to use a different ontology. What OXO can do is it can help you to map from um, the, um, the term, from the ontology to the ontology that you prefer to use. So if we look at OS, um, CGIR has um, a number of ontologies already on um, OS. So um, I think if you look on the left hand side, you'll see the agronomy um, ontology that is available on OS, but then there's also various uh, crop related ontologies. And uh, as far as I can see, there's at least 30 ontologies, but I think, um, or crop related ontologies, um, but I think it's even more than that. So yeah, there's quite a few number of um, crop related ontologies on OS at the moment. Um, if you look more in detail at the um, functionality provided by OS, then um, the very first thing is really the search functionality. So you can go and search by identify if that is what you have, or you can um, search by the label of uh, the concept that you're looking for, or its synonym. And that will actually bring back a large number of results potentially for you. Um, if we assume it, that we've looked for um, a nitrogen fertilizer, then um, you'll see there's quite a list of um, results. And if we just go to this first selection, then um, we can see how this is displayed on OS. So the first thing you can see here is this, this is the label of the um, term that you have. Then right underneath it, this is the, um, the identifier. So this is the unique identifier that's associated with this, this concept. Um, here at the top, you can see a shorter um, version of this um, uh, identifier, and that's usually just used in a communication, so to make um, conversation more compact, um, but the truly unique identifier is this one here. Um, then here's the definition for this um, concept, and then we also have the display, uh, um, a tree-like display for this on um, term. And what you can see here is that nitrogen fertilizer is a type of inorganic fertilizer, which is a type of ag um, agronomic fertilizer. But again, then what you can also see is that um, nitrogen fertilizer um, or ammonium nitrate is a type of um, nitrogen fertilizer. Ammonium sulfate is a type of um, nitrogen fertilizer. And all these children really are um, types of nitrogen fertilizer. If you look on the right side here, um, this is where we display the annotations. Now the annotations are given um, uh, uh, per term basically. So, and it's very dependent on the um, the creators of the ontology, how they 
um, end up de uh, defining that to a large extent and the kind of um, annotations that they associate with the term. So in this case, you can see that a creator has been stated and this um, creator has this ORCID ID, um, which you can go and um, find, uh, read up on it to find more details about who created this term. Um, then what you also see is the logical relationships for this term. So we can see that this term is equivalent to inorganic fertilizer and has part some nitrogen atom. And this is, um, if you like, this is the, um, let's say the English version of the underlying mathematics that um, is used to represent this term. Um, and it also states that inorganic, um, it's a subclass of inorganic fertilizer. Um, if we now assume that we go and look at something like ammonium sulfate, you can again see that there's a unique identifier, the definition, but you can also see synonyms. So in the previous case, we didn't really have, they didn't provide um, synonyms di directly. So there's a synonym, but it also has some um, related synonyms and again various terms that is provided and you can also see that um, ammonium sulfate is a ergonic, um, inorganic sulfate salt and um, you can see this information for uh, uh, various um, parents that um, is associated with um, uh, ammonium sulfate um, because some of these uh, term relations can be let's say not that easy to um, visualize necessarily we do provide a way to visualize this so here you can see the uh, visualization for the relationship to this um, specific concept in OS. Um, then as we said that um, the problem that you have is when you look for something on OS, you really actually need to know what you want to look at because otherwise you can very easily be overwhelmed by the amount of uh, results that's being returned. So in this case, um, uh, what do you do? So what, what do you do if you're looking for a term, but you, um, you don't know which ontology to use necessarily? That is where our um, Zuma service becomes um, useful and valuable. So the idea here is to say, okay, I have some um, uh, uh, text uh, that I would like to map to ontology terms. And in this box here, I've um, text box here, I have nitrogen fertilizer, wax, wax ester, and seed weight. And these are the three, uh, the four um, bits of string that I would like to map to ontology terms. And if I do that on Zuma, what I would get is the following results. So to make sense of this, is what we can see here is nitrogen fertilizer. Um, has been mapped to this term. Um, so this is a short um, name for this term, and it's defined in the, um, the agronomy ontology. Um, and we, if we uh, click on this, that will take you to OLS to um, view the information there. But what you will see is it also gives you a good mapping. And the reason why it gives you a good mapping here is that, well, it maps to the label of the ontology and it maps exactly to that label, but you can't be beyond the shadow of a doubt, be sure that that is in fact um, uh, um, a sensible translation or uh, the, mo the best um, term to be used for uh, nitrogen fertilizer. And the reason why we don't have that information is because we don't actually have curated information where a curator actually looked at it and said, well, in fact, nitrogen is really best represented by this term. And that's where wax ester, where you can see you have a high mapping confidence. You can see that that mapped to, um, exactly to the um, ontology label, but over and above that, um, uh, this term was associated um, by the Metabolites um, project um, and data source. So this is represents um, actual biocurators that sat and said, wax ester maps best to Chebby um, 10036. Um, and similarly, if, if you have medium weight, so there you have a good weight, um, here you have a medium weight, and it maps exactly to a term um, 
in a crop ontology. And uh, the reason in this case why it's medium but not good back in nitrogen fertilizer is because there's multiple, mu multiple mappings um, to different ontologies. And for that reason, the um, confidence level moves down. Um, these ontologies, these are uh, crop ontologies. And once again, if you click on the um, link, that will take you to the appropriate um, crop ontology in OLS. Um, so now let's say you have a term, but it's not using the um, ontology that you would like to use in your team. So in your team, you've decided on using a specific ontology, um, but this term is not from that ontology. Is there any way for you to get to that term in that ontology? And the way to do that is to um, make use of OXO, or that's where OXO can help, at least to some extent. Um, so if we have, um, take the Chebi example again of nitrogen fertilizer, um, we have Chebi 10036, and if we now try to map it to something else, at the distance of one. I'll talk a bit more about the distance. Um, you can see it maps to a number of um, potential terms at distance ones, one. Um, the distance here gives you an idea of the hops. So um, in this case, we have um, Chebi maps directly to um, P PMID. Um, but sometimes it may need another hop to another term before it actually gets to, to the ontology that you want. Um, so you could have longer distances. When you do use this, we actually recommend starting at distance uh, one. And only if you don't get um, results, then you should move up to distance two. And only if you don't succeed with distance two, should you even consider going to distance three. And the main reason is that the amount of results that you can get back can very uh, quickly explode substantially. Um, and you end up getting so many results that um, it actually um, is quite overwhelming. Um, so if we now assume that we're interested in this mapping uh, Chebi to PMID um, long number ending with 54, um, we can go and find that information or click on that and that will provide us with the mapping information in that regard. Um, so where does this mapping come from though? So when people create these ontologies, what they can do is they can actually supply database cross references. And what you can see here is why, oh, I've actually confused, sorry. Um, Chebi, this was wax ester, apologies. I've referred to it as nitrogen, my apologies. Um, so this maps to um, a number of uh, PMID uh, uh, terms, but this is the one here that we've selected in the previous slide. Um, so just so you can see where this information is coming from. And we load this from the ontologies um, at intervals. Um, then what have we learned over the time? Um, well, we see that with um, the use of ontologies that the data um, is getting better. Um, uh, tools like Zuma and OXO does help to improve the quality of um, ontologies um, and um, the terms being used, but um, there's still a large number of terms that we can't map very well um, because we just don't have sufficient context to know and um, unambiguously to um, identify that this bit of text um, with this amount of context maps to this ontology term. Um, one thing I didn't actually mention in terms of Zuma is when you have a high confidence value, that also means for um, uh, curators that I potentially can accept that value um, easily, whereas your lower confidence values will um, make uh, give you indication that this definitely needs um, ad additional investigation. So, so what we also found in this is that um, our semantics um, are valuable in um, defining ontologies, 
but um, we had to devise our own ways to represent these. And so if you look at OS, for instance, um, underlying, we store the data in Neo4j to provide that um, graphical representation. Um, and to make this searchable, we actually store a lot of the information also in solar. Um, uh, and using um, uh, our files just directly um, doesn't provide you that same power um, than to store this in Neo4j and solar, for example. Um, then what we also found is that um, developers in general are more familiar with JSON and um, the REST response of uh, uh, REST APIs providing JSON responses. So um, uh, there's not a strong preference to use um, semantic web technologies directly. So you being able to access these um, tools via our APIs without having to have a strong understanding of um, the semantic web technologies is desirable by many um, developers. Um, so what does the future hold for us in this regard? Um, well, uh, we certainly need more sophisticated search options in OLS and Zuma, um, particularly if we want to provide better context information. Um, and then um, if we look at something like OXO, the problem that you have is when you find that this term maps to that term in that ontology, what exactly is meant by those mappings um, is very dependent on the different ontologies. And to that extent, this work um, being done currently on the simple standard for sharing ontology mappings, um, which aims to um, make these mappings more concise and the meaning of these mappings uh, more clear that when you do follow a certain um, set of mappings, that there's clear understanding of what you end up with. Um, that's not something that we at this st stage have a good understanding of. Then some references to our um, tools. If you want to go and have a look at some of our tools and a reference to our uh, SSOM, um, the work on SSOM that's being done. Thank you very much, Arya. Now it's time for questions and comments from the audience. I can see that we already have one question from Meda Devare. Uh, thank you so very much. This is really exciting. We are working on a, 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 a sort of a fair workflow uh, to, to mm -hmm. enable people to, in a very user-friendly way, uh, without necessarily knowing the ins and outs of ontologies, to be able to annotate their data. Uh, mm -hmm. Researchers don't always know, most of them don't know what an ontology is and don't need to. They've got other things to do. Precisely. Uh, so, yes, and so we want to make it easy to, to mm. be able to generate RDF and be able to do really cool stuff with the, with the data, slice and dice it and mine it in ways that it can be mined technically. So this is absolutely fantastic, very exciting. Uh, we would like to reuse a lot of what you've done if it's open source in, you know, in the fair workflow that we're building. My question is, um, well, that was one of my questions, but the other question is with OXO in particular, um, you know, we, we, we focus on ontologies here, but in the agriculture domain uh, with our, particularly for CGIR, uh, people are using AgroVoc quite a bit. Um, and, and that, is, you know, is, a, is, a, is, comes, you know, the terms are, have URIs associated with them. But in addition to that, uh, what's particularly important to researchers is to be able to describe their data in terms that are acceptable, that make it easy to get from the data to crop models. Normally that takes, you know, weeks, if not months of massaging the data to get it to, to, hmm. to model ready shape. But with a tool like this, that could be much easier because the crop models typically use uh, a data uh, dictionary called the CASA variables that has been developed uh, by the crop modeling community with, you know, in, if, after many years of work. So what I'm wondering is what does it take? I know this is not black magic. I mean, I don't know what it takes for OXO under the hood to, to be able to accommodate mappings with, uh, yeah. you know, walk I imagine might be easier, but, but with something like the CASA variables. Yeah. Um, so I'm not very familiar with the, um, uh, what is the word you mentioned? Um, Agrovoc. Agrovoc. Uh, 
Vox. Sorry, I have a slight hearing problem, so that's why. I, I put it so, in chat. Yeah, well. yeah, that would be helpful. So um, I am not off the cuff familiar with AgroVoc, um, but what I can say is in general, what really works well with uh, um, OXO, if you already have an ontology that has these sort of database cross-references, then um, all the ontologies in OLS in any way is um, uh, read by OXO and um, imported into OXO. So all the cross-references are um, read um, that are available in um, OLS, and that's um, imported into OXO. Um, that's the one way. The other way is that um, sometimes that we have specific mapping files that are um, we've um, upload into um, OXO. Mm -hmm. So if this AgroVoc has some um, mapping potentially, or if there's some mapping file available somewhere, we can mm -hmm. certainly have a look at seeing how easy it would be to have that imported into um, OXO. I suspect there's a reasonable chance that it will be something that we will need to, um, I, I don't know that there's a specific standard that um, have these mappings. Mm -hmm. So it would probably be a um, custom import that we have to build for that. Um, but that is a possibility. What will be very helpful is if you have any such um, uh, uh, desires is to actually also open up for all our tools you can open up tickets on the yeah. um, github mm -hmm. and um, from there on we have it on mm -hmm. tracking and it's mainly that we can track our um, workflow in terms Absolutely. of project workload sounds great thank you very much thank you oh and the last question i guess <laughs> oh, the the earlier question was whether zuma and oxo are uh, they're open source so we can actually oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. So all these are um, open source, they're available. Um, uh, so they're all available on GitHub. So you can download the source, you can potentially go and change the source. Um, you can, um, uh, there's, there's um, Docker containers available for them. So mm -hmm. you can mm -hmm. load it with Docker containers with your mm -hmm. own data as well, if that is what you desire. Fantastic. Because, you know, we're almost ready with the fair workflow. I could imagine that this could be a real good um, boost to it. Thank you very much. Pleasure. Thank you very much, Henriette and Meta. So now Magali would like to ask a question. Yes, thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I was just curious to know, how do you choose a cross-reference database term, which is to map in OXO, when uh, there are many PMID, for example? In your example, you, you said you have selected one, but I have not understood why. Um, okay, so <laughs> um, I have to be honest in that regard. I, I didn't have a, a good reason to choose that specific one. Um, uh, you probably, uh, could I, yeah, maybe I should share my screen again. So um, the thing is that's defined on the ontology. So if you go and look for that ontology, it maps to a number of um, ontology terms. And I think that highlights part of the issue with um, the mappings on OXO. So I'm not saying that OXO is not valuable, but you also have to be careful of what you understand with the mapping. Why is there so many uh, PMID um, linked to, to Wax Ester? And that's because in the ontology, so in Chebi, it's been linked to that many. Um, so if you really want to know why you want to map to that one, the way you will have to go and look at it is by going and see what's the meaning of each of these and whether there's a difference in meaning that is of consequence in your environment. Um, that there's unfortunately no um, easy way. And that's why this um, uh, SSOM that I've mentioned here um, is actually of um, substantial importance in my mind, at least. Um, and a number of other people in the um, uh, in this environment that uh, see this weakness is that when we have the mappings, it's not exactly clear what those mappings mean. And it's particularly if you start, it's one thing if I potentially map from one term to another term, it becomes a bit more difficult if I map from term in one ontology to a term in the next ontology to a term in the next ontology and if um, the kind of mappings potentially differ what does that mean um, 
uh, that that is why this standard is um, important. So I think the way I would use OXO really is um, by identifying, sorry, um, I'm scrolling around, by um, using it to say, oh, so I have a wax ester mapping to these terms. So instead of in OS, there's 6.5 million terms. So instead of considering 6.5 million terms, what I now have is this list of terms. So I have to go and go through this list of terms and think which one is the most appropriate for my environment potentially. Um, so it, um, it's not as helpful as it can be, but it uh, is making the situation at least better by still limiting it a bit to what you have to look at. Um, I, I'm unsure that I answer your question uh, sufficiently. Yes, it was much clearer and it is very helpful to have such tools. Yes. Thank you very much. Uh, Kai Bloomberg, would you like to ask your, your question? Sure, thank you. Nice presentation. So I just wanted to, following up on that and the previous, um, regarding SSSOM and OXO mappings, yes. in the example you showed the use of database cross-references in the mappings, which is pretty common within OBO systems as far as I know, um, but there's some OBO systems or discussion of using other ex um, annotation properties as synonyms like SCOS exact synonym or et cetera, or others. Mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if there's been any resolution of best practices or recommendations for what we ontology developers should be using in that regard? Or yeah, um, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, uh, my best um, uh, advice there is really to look at this SSOM um, standard that we're working on, or um, rather I'm um, involved in it, but um, this is more under Nico's work, um, Nico and David's work. So I would really, I would really consider that as the um, standard to look at. In the example, the, in the example SSOM, Nico mm -hmm. has put exact match yeah. in that example, whereas OXO seems to be using database cross-reference in your example. Yeah, yeah, that is in fact using the database cross-reference. Um, the idea is so, um, uh, for OXO at least, is that we want to update it based on the SSOM standard. So that is where OXO, um, where we hope to go with OXO. Great, thanks. Eric, until now. Oh, yeah, thanks for the presentation. Really nice summary of, of the tools you guys provide. I have actually two, two questions. Uh, the first one is uh, more going into the future, let's say, of the tools. And I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit on the, on the roadmap for the tools, and uh, especially for the OLS tool. If you could share with us, I mean, I don't know, perhaps something around the new key features that you have on the horizon, uh, any mm. timelines that you see for new developments or new things coming okay. up. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, we've had a um, OLS user day um, last week on, um, so regarding OLS in specific, in which we discussed some use cases. So that is something that, um, we will share in the community and um, provide uh, opportunities for people to vote on, um, to give some indication. So just because some, uh, let's say use case got a very high voting doesn't mean that it's necessarily the one that we will give the most attention to, but at least gives us some ideas to what is desired in the um, community. Um, we also have to see where our funding is coming from really. Um, so that is something we also need to keep in mind. Um, the key challenge we have in um, OLS at the moment is that we have um, uh, 260 ontologies in OLS and actually the indexing takes a long time. So um, where indexing typically ran on a daily basis from Monday to Friday and, um, and each day it would pick up the latest ontologies um, and the new changes and be able to have the latest changes available the next day. Sometimes these run for a week. Um, and um, we actually have a um, situation where it times out. So um, in our in, in environment, you cannot run um, any process for more than seven days. So if it runs um, for longer than seven days, it just basically aborts the process. Um, and you have to start from the beginning. 
and, and that's a problem for us. So uh, if we have to re-index all our ontologies on OS, um, that will take, um, we estimate between three to four weeks to um, um, update that. And, and that's a problem for us. So what is one of the things that we are looking at is how to redesign the indexing so that we can index at a much faster rate. We really want to be able to get to a point where we can re-index at the drop of a hat. Because what this comes down to really is that um, everything that uh, we have with regards to ontologies is really how people can search that. And if we can't update our indexes quickly enough, we cannot provide that feature across the board, across all our ontologies um, immediately. So, so that's a key concern. So some of the use cases that are, that are sort of on the horizon as part of this is uh, multiple language support, um, uh, search by categories or tagging, um, uh, slims um, or subsets, uh, support for slims or subsets. Um, that's just right up um, a top of um, uh, that I can recall now immediately of the key um, use cases that came up. Um, but we will have a, that communication in the near future. Thank you very much. Yes. And uh, yeah, the, the second one is uh, going a bit more in the direction of um, the, let's say, not only the user experience, but also on how, let's say, the tools you provide for the, not only the, e the community within the EBI and perhaps beyond, let's say, are, are handled at the level of the governance, uh, specifically at the level of the data governance. Is there anything you could share with us at that level? Because, you know, this is a sort of uh, trendy topic nowadays in terms of trying to organize, uh, let's say, the different, not only the different ontologies available in the community, but also trying to bring, uh, um, let's say, uh, or recognize certain roles like stewards and people who are curating the data. Is, is this somehow, I mean, is this somehow on, on which, let's say, those tools could also be supporting? Could you share um, maybe? Yeah, um, so that that's not something that we are um, considering extensively at this stage, um, but it is something that um, has come up in the sense that uh, people want to know sort of the provenance of some information. So mm -hmm. I have a term that says this or that, um, what, what's the provenance that's um, behind this term? So um, that is the kind of things that we are thinking of. Mm -hmm. um, then there's also that might be related to this is um, there seems to be a need for greater contextualization and sort of uh, that people, depending on a certain context, want to see certain information um, mm -hmm. and uh, not necessarily other information um, to provide some capabilities of that, but that that is in terms of our uh, redesign, things that we are thinking of to make those capabilities um, available. Um, but to be honest, we haven't had that, have that um, pinned down 100% as yet. But if you have um, needs there, please drop us a note on um, uh, our GitHub repository, um, open an issue, uh, because for us knowing about these things, particularly because we are um, looking at the sort of redesign, at least of the indexing of OLS, um, this is things that we need to know and um, will be valuable for us to know in terms of um, shaping the future of these tools. Mm -hmm. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you very much, Antonis. Yes, uh, hello, thank you. I meant to ask about uh, uh, the the different kind of uh, matchers that you may be using for uh, producing uh, the mappings in uh, OXO, and uh, as I think that uh, apart from uh, from uh, the lexical uh, similarity, other kind of mappers could uh, possibly help uh, with the problem of contextualizing uh, a term. And uh, in relation to, to that, um, how, how do you determine the confidence in, uh, in a mapping? The confidence actually in um, OXO 
is based on um, how many sources we've been able to find. That says that this term can map to that term. Um, so, and, uh, so it's really just a count of um, the mappings. Um, the, there's not much sophistication. And in terms of, so you, I, I think in your, um, if I look at the chat, what you've also mentioned is um, mappers. Uh, okay. Um, yeah, so the mapping is based on the IDs um, and really being able that we have some information stating that this ID is mapping to that. Um, or this um, identifier is mapped to that identifier. Um, there's no um, sort of string mapping in um, OXO per se. Uh, so we, we're not really searching for textual strings. We more look towards the identifiers in OXO. The, the, the basis of uh, the mapping is also from what I've understood in the five minutes I checked on the tool, uh, also based on curated mappings from uh, humans, right? Yeah, yeah, well, look, um, so these, uh, for instance, these database cross-references that are added onto the ontologies that we base part of this at least on is, um, is added by humans. So it's not mm -hmm. something we um, uh, think up well, the think up part that we do on our site is when you specify the distance where we say, okay, um, this term maps to that term and that terms map to that term. So that, uh, I would say your accuracy potentially goes down the further the distance is that you find the mapping at. Um, just because um, you add the potential variability in what that mapping means. Yeah, yeah. As, uh, as the association uh, deepens, uh, yeah. you, you assume that there is uh, an error introduced in uh, the mapping potential. That, yeah. That's what I got from uh, the presentation. Yeah. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much, Yet for, for this webinar. I can say that you thoroughly prepared it, I know, because you were also concerned of being not um, an expert in agriculture. But I must say, uh, we exchange and really, uh, it's a very good webinar. So thank you again. Thank you for all the connected uh, colleagues. And thanks again to Ariette and Céline for organizing.